The set you've just seen is the nerve center of a secret five-story underground laboratory, which is the star of the Andromeda strain, my new film for Universal, which is based on last year's best-selling novel. It's the story of the world's first space-age crisis. Hello and welcome aboard Hot Wamper episode 36. I'm Dave. I'm Mark. And this is just a brief introduction to the show, our little housekeeping section that we have at the beginning of every episode of Hot Wamper when we just go through basic admin and where we are and what we're up to at the moment. Um, the Hot Wamper mailing list now exists, it's a real thing. Not as many of our regulars or our hardcore punters on there as we'd like to have, I don't think. It's growing though, Dave, isn't it? I think we've got um, plenty of others that we know would be interested. So Yeah, no excuses. We've tagged the people we want on that mailing list, so you know we're after you. Um, so if those people we've tagged could, it so, could at some point just email the Hot Womper email, which is hot.womper at yahoo.co.uk, please. Then we can have your email address then we can get show notes, information, what's coming up in the next episode out to you well in advance of the next episode because we don't believe people are getting to see what we're putting on social media, do we? No, Facebook seems to be a bit fickle about what it shows to people, doesn't it? Very much hit and miss. So that's what we want to do. That gives you guys a chance. If you want to do a review, you can do. If you see something that's kind of, oh, that's my best film or my favourite film, or you've got a real strong opinion on something that's coming up, we can then get that in advance. And, you know, we can include your thoughts and notes in the episode. Just makes it a little bit easier, I think, just to get out to people and give people that heads up. Certainly. And, uh, you know, we, we've we've been very fortunate with what we have received, haven't we, so far? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we want to keep expanding. I mean, uh, you know, I've been out in a... The Netherlands in the re- the last week, and I've been uh, putting hot wamper stickers in the public conveniences, which I'm not sure is the best place to put them, but there we are. I'm sure that will get some sort of clientele on board. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's what we would like to do. I mean, that is not an exclusive email list. No. Um, some gentleman we'd never heard of, Kevin Fitzgerald, is a listener. He's out there. He emailed us and asked to go on that list. He's on the mailing list, Kev. So if you're listening, you're on there, mate. Any of our listeners can go on that mailing list. I think it's easy sometimes to hide behind your headphones. Like you know, you just yeah. you're just a listener, but you can be more if you want to be. That's that's the whole whole point of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we want to include people's opinions. If we you know say something that's contrary to what somebody thinks, or as somebody has a better input they can offer on something, throw it at us. We'll put it in the show. That mailing list as well is strictly confidential. We will under no circumstances pass anybody's email on to any third party and we will of course respect everybody that's on that mailing list if they want to be removed from that mailing list we will do so yeah let us know but it's just a way of us getting news what's coming up everything to people in advance and giving them that heads up because like i said we don't think that our social media is being that effective no so it's just a way of us reaching people so that's it exists now. Like I said, we've, we've tagged a lot of people we'd like to have in that mailing list. If you've been tagged, it's because we haven't got your email. So all of those people, I'm not going to say names on the air, if you could please get your email to us and then we can keep you better informed. Yeah, well, others, like it I won't said. be every week, will it? Well, it'll be a couple of times a month. No, if we're looking perhaps for reviews, yeah, um, or we know well in advance, let's say a week in advance, what the next episode's going to be on the showcase... Or some real thick and meaty Star Wars news, which is a bit topical or what have you, comes up. We can get that to people first and early and hopefully give them plenty of time if they want to say something about it to get it back to us. Because there's a production process to the show. Me and Mark were just discussing this about the the time and the different things we go through in order to organise and get a show ready. And anything, I think if we can get to you guys early gives you a chance to get it back to us earlier and it makes it easier all around doesn't it it does yeah it's it's nice to you know 
we're not exactly being pushed in a certain direction, but we kind of go with the flow, don't we? we you know, if someone is suggesting something, yeah. then it certainly helps us uh, put together the show. A, a lot of the stuff that comes into the show comes back via Mark, who then passes it to me. And that can be quite a complicated process because then somebody will record or format text or audio on their device or computer, which they'll send to Mark, which he'll perhaps access on his computer, access on his computer or his phone or something, which then he'll relay to me via Messenger. And it's probably getting re-encoded and the format's changing every time. Yeah. By the time it gets into my Messenger inbox, I might not even be able to open it or decode it or something. So if we can encourage people to use that email, so then me as producer could jump straight into that email, pull the file, and it's in my Dropbox. And it's there to access for the next episode or the show. We, we cert- I mean, we were speaking about this. We've certainly become slicker, haven't we? I mean, as, as we've gone on, you know, 36 episodes. Yeah. We just discussed that. There is no manual on podcasting. No. It's a matter of trying to find out what works, listening to a lot of podcasts, we're constantly looking at articles and videos and tutorials online, trying to evolve the show and trying to make the show work better. It's an ongoing process. It is, yeah. You know, and hopefully people that have been with us right from our very crude, difficult listening start with lawnmowers in the background and mopeds and cats running around the recording room on the keyboard and all the rest of it and all those mistakes we made earlier on are hearing some of an evolution in what they're getting back to them now and it is improving which is what we aim to do not much more on housekeeping have you got much more you want to inject into that not not really on the housekeeping front i think uh yeah i think as you've said it all there really yeah that's pretty much where we are let's get on with what news we've got on star wars quite a bit it's okay. mostly on Star Wars Episode 8 costume news mm-hmm. um, I've pulled these two stories although they're both connected via the costuming theme from separate websites I think you. I, I think I've got one of them the same but go, go ahead so. possibly this one comes from Star Wars News Club and it's dated the 2nd of November 2016 under the title Luke's Episode 8 Wardrobe Revealed The rumours of costume leaks for episode 8 first started circulating back in April. There were murmurs, even a few sketches from people who claimed to have seen mysterious photos of the costume on set. Now, thanks to the Nerdist.com doing some research into a making Star Wars story, we have new details, new hints, and we even commissioned an artist rendering to help give you a visual of Luke's new threads. That's no use to you on a podcast because you can't see it. Back in April... The costume rumour revealed that Luke would not be sporting the robes we saw him in at the end of The Force Awakens. He would be changing out of his lighter coloured flowing robes for something a little more battle ready and much more reminiscent of his all black look in Return of the Jedi. We now have new details that are stating that the costume is mostly dark greys. He will have a cloak that is somewhere in between a poncho and the cape we saw Captain Phasma wearing in The Force Awakens. The original report also likened Luke's new attire to that of Count Dooku's tunic in the prequels. I find that interesting, as Dooku was once a Jedi, before turning to the dark side, and his motives were always towing the line of good and evil. But that's probably reading too much into it. They've commissioned their own artist rendition of the costume. The story continues with a much less surprising reveal. We will once again see Luke in his black glove, This is probably a cost-saving measure more than a specific purposeful costume choice. It's far easier to have him wear a glove than create his CGI robotic hand for the entire film. The most interesting thing about all of this is that the rumour slated that Luke was not seen with his lightsaber, but rather a shorter staff or cane. This has led to theories that, at least early on, Luke has decided to forego the saber and instead utilise only his force powers. Or, as the Nerdist.com hopefully theorised, perhaps Luke has a sword, cane, sabre. Also in the report, Luke's costume stays dirty, which to me means hopefully we are seeing Luke in action, whether it be training Rey in Battle of the Knights of Ren, or all of the above. Mm. Slightly different look to our Luke. 
Well, I don't know. And the last one, he did look a bit dishevelled at the end, didn't he? He's sort of, you know, in, the, in the, those robes. So perhaps he's um, slickening up his act a bit now he's got um, someone visiting him. I reckon he just got out of bed. Yeah. I reckon that's like his dressing gown. Oh, he's like, oh, who's this? Yeah. Bloody hell. He was just stood there picking bits of his um, Rice Krispies out of his beard and then Ray walks up and offers him a lightsaber he hasn't seen in years and years and years. And hopefully a napkin. <clears throat> um, but, I mean, Ray's got that staff, hasn't she? Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, could Luke have sort of taken that on and uh, trained with her with staff as she's used to using one? I don't know. Yeah, um, I think the staff thing is probably a bit like the old um, Tuscan Raiders, the sand people, where they have a gaffy stick. It's just a crude weapon fashioned out of wreckage she's come across on Jakku. Yeah. Something like that. And obviously she she's become very skilled and knows how to utilise that. Jakku's quite a rough place and that's been part of her survival strategy. Also, um, the cross-link with uh, Rogue One and uh, Donnie Yen with uh, the staff that he uses, so... Yeah, yeah, well, the guy's blind. I mean, I wouldn't give him a lightsaber. No, that's true. <laughs> he wouldn't no, be able to stand on it, would he? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, you know what I mean? If you, if you, if I'd get bored. I couldn't be a Jedi. I'd get bored. If I had that thing hanging down my side, I'd be mucking about with it, flicking mm-hmm. switches and stuff. I'm just the same now with my phone or my iPod and that. I'll just sit there mucking about with Looking it. Looking at bored. settings, yeah. Yeah. So if I was blind and doing that, that could be lethal. I could have it going through my legs or something like that. You certainly wouldn't have many visitors, would you? Oh, good God, no. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, Luke's new gear does look quite sharp and quite bat already. Um, it looks, to me, to be a slightly shorter, lighter cape than the sort of robes we've seen him wearing in, at the end of Episode 8. It looks a little like Obi-Wan in the Clone Wars. Yeah, I mean, this is only an artist's yeah, impression. Yeah, this isn't the real deal. And this isn't gospel, because, as we know, they're keeping shtum about these actual things from this, the sets. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I mean, maybe it is. This whole thing with a cane, do you think that's a bit of an homage in an exiled Jedi in a very primitive place that the exiled Jedi is living, back to Yoda. Yeah, we saw be. him on Dagobah, dishevelled basic robes, he no longer had a lightsaber, mm-hmm. he was hobbling about with a cane, pet snakes. Snake round his neck, yeah. Do you think perhaps this is something like, you know, Jedi in exile adopt a, a much simpler and much more minimal existence and the cane is part of that. Yeah, and the lightsaber's always around if he needs it. And he, with his Jedi powers, he could probably just summon it, you know. Or even with Obi-Wan Kenobi back on his his little hovel, his homestead on Tatooine. Mm-hmm. He had a very simple existence, didn't he? Yeah. Very basic robes. Admittedly, he kept his lightsaber handy, as we saw in the cantina, but then Tatooine, you know, Mos Eisley, you're not finding a more wretched hive of scum and villainy, as we know. Yeah, exactly. So perhaps that was, you know, more practical that he kept his saber. Perhaps. I'm mean, interested what they're saying about the hand. I mean, what what happened to Luke's hand? You know, where did the, the sort of outer flesh go from that uh, robotic hand? Well, that's probably got dissolved somewhere in the in the atmosphere of Bespin, didn't it? It's a gas giant. It probably kept descending through the layers till it either cooked or got crushed by pressure, and it's part of Bespin, I'd have thought. Yeah, no, but I mean the, the current metal hand, you know, because he had oh, the, um, you remember he had the fleshy, fleshy outer uh, yeah, in yeah. Return of the Jedi, so why is it now just a, a metal metal hand? Like what, a claw? Yeah. I guess so, I mean, that fl- uh, it had like a synthetic covering, didn't it, that Pro- got damaged in Return of the Jedi, hence the glove. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess so, I suppose the fabric... He or- never got it repaired. No, I never had it stitched up. No. Or he was putting his hand in the bath and it was too hot, <laughs> he didn't realise and he just melted it. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, off. there was no droid around to repair it so it's like, just, a, like a Terminator uh, moment yeah yeah so hopefully yeah we'll see Luke a, a bit sharper in this one you know and um, we'll see him getting on with training Ray so it's interesting to get that costume in use I think the in- initial thing was people were disappointed how much Luke Skywalker uh, appeared in uh, Force Awakens but the actual story itself sort of you know took away that yeah, uh, so I'm sure we're hoping in this one there will be a sort of a bit more of Mark Hamill. Yeah, let's hope so, and a little bit different to the to the Luke we see saw in the original trilogy as well. He'd be a bit more of a seasoned, wily, sagey character, I think. A bit more gruff, but I hope there's a little humour there as well, because you you know I always find that these sort of master Jedi's they do have a bit of sarcasm and, and you know, little nods and winks. They're not all totally serious, are they? No, of course, but you got to have a laugh, haven't you? Yeah, you have to. You know, especially, but he seems to have a very much an isolationist existence, whether that's a spiritual choice or whether that's just so that he can't be found. He's in exile, effectively. Yeah. You know, who knows? A similar theme on the costume in front for Star Wars, SlashFilm.com dated the November the 2nd, 2016. 
How Star Wars Episode 8 might change Kylo Ren's costume to reflect his Darth Vader obsession. This is the one I have, yeah. Yeah. There is a palpable sense of history in Star Wars The Force Awakens that goes beyond nostalgia. It can be seen in the aged faces of Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher, but it can also be sensed in the way that Rey and Finn treat the events of the original trilogy. Someone forgot to set the facts in stone. The legend was only partially printed. Reputations have faded. Heroes have been forgotten. For all of its colourful action, there's a sense of melancholy around the edges of the film that sticks with me almost a year later. And the character who stuck with me most is Kylo Ren, the Darth Vader-inspired First Order attack dog whose obsession with the late Anakin Skywalker will apparently deepen in Star Wars Episode VIII. Is the Statue of Limitations on openly discussing The Force Awakens spoiler up yet? I think it is. Yeah. I think that's what I think we, we revealed it like, I don't know, a long time ago because, uh, you know, it's out there. Yeah, because we're just going to dive right into this. As we learned in J.J. Abrams' film, Kylo Ren, played by Adam Driver, is the new identity of Ben Solo, the son of Han Solo and Leia Organa, the nephew of Luke Skywalker and the grandson of Anakin Skywalker. While not officially a Sith, he certainly dresses like one utilising a black wardrobe and a voice-changing metal mask that would make even Vader himself tell him to turn it down a little. And as we saw in The Force Awakens, he has somehow managed to get his hands on Vader's charred helmet, <laughs> which was last seen melting on a funeral pyre on the forest moon of Endor. Making Star Wars, who are generally reliable when it comes to this stuff, but go ahead and grab a grain of salt anyway, reports that Kylo Ren's Sifalite wardrobe will get an upgrade in Ryan Johnson's Star Wars Episode VIII. According to sources, Kylo Ren is wearing a Darth Vader cape in Star Wars Episode VIII. The cape is said to be like the one Darth Vader wears in The Empire Strikes Back slash Return of the Jedi. However, the cape does not have the same chain clasp. It is not entirely clear if this cape is one Kylo made to resemble that of his grandfather's, or if he actually procured one of Darth Vader's capes that probably fell into the hands of collectors in the Star Wars galaxy. While making Star Wars cannot confirm whether or not Kylo Ren is actually wearing a piece of his grandfather's old wardrobe, it wouldn't be beyond beyond the realm of possibility. After all, he did manage to acquire his helmet. And plus, Imperial artifacts are all the rage in this era of the Star Wars timeline. In the novel Star Wars Aftermath, we are offered a quick glimpse at an underground black market for objects that were part of the Empire with one character attempting to purchase Darth Vader's lightsaber, or at least what he is told is Darth Vader's lightsaber. In Star Wars Bloodline, Senator Leia Organa has to deal with younger politicians who collect Imperial memorabilia, seeing them as fascinating historical objects rather than the tools of an evil regime. In other words, the larger Star Wars canon has established that it is possible to obtain objects from the original Galactic Civil War, provided that you know the right guy. And even if he is wearing a replica, it wouldn't change the subtext that makes Kylo Ren so fascinating. Like actual real-world Star Wars fans, he's tethered to the past. These are their words, by the way, not mine. Obsessed with a figure who died 30 years ago and still lo- looms large over his world. The fact that we smile and click share whenever we see Darth Vader pop up in a car commercial only deepens our quiet ties to the doomed Ben Solo. We are Kylo Ren, and maybe the new movie seems to suggest we should be more like Rey. Okay, that got dark. To recap, Kylo Ren is getting a new outfit. So is Luke Skywalker. For the record, Star Wars Episode 8 opens on December the 15th, 2017. Bit of idol worship there from Kylo Ren? Yeah, I find, I find it interesting, you know, with, um, like, I guess, Second World War memorabilia. I mean, it's, it's kind of like there are collectors out there and you just have to ask ethically is it right you know is it is it the right thing to do what who would want something like that other than a museum so yeah that, that yeah that would be my point i think for an ethically for an individual to be fascinated and collect something like i don't know nazi helmets or something like that is a bit dicey i don't think it's tasteful it's not something that, whilst the history aspect of it does fascinate me i think it can fascinate me without me physically owning something from that era yeah um in the context of a museum, I think it's fine. Yeah. Because it explains and shows people what they've got. But, I mean, this guy isn't ethical anyway, is he, Kylo Ren? No. I mean, he's he's out there, he's um, he's Lord Snoke's um, attack dog, you know, he's Darth Vader's grandson. He refers in episode seven to finishing the work his grandfather began. So, obviously, he's got a bit of a lineage thing, you know, he, he wants to imitate Darth Vader and 
looks to him. Well, we knew Han Solo had it coming from then, I guess, didn't we? What, slaying his own father? Yeah. Yeah. Not a great situation. Um, but fascinating to see that there's going to be this evolution in costumes, whether it's going to be like a slightly more different direction or whether it's going to be very reminiscent of what we've seen so far in, in the original trilogy. Who knows? The, the main thing, I think, there's the chain clasp. That, you know, that's, so it isn't an actual Darth Vader co- uh, cloak. It's kind of like um, a version of it, isn't it? You know. Yeah, I guess so. I think even Lando's cloak had a chain on it. It didn't did, it? didn't it? Um, well, so I've got a bit more on that. Um, while Ren's mask will remain similar to his Force Awakens costume, with some minor minor tweaks. I thought the look of Kylo Ren in the Force Awakens was quite good. Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, he was definitely sinister, and I think um, you know before he took, even after he took his mask off, we we got this like petulant teenager who was like happy to smash things up when he weren't things weren't going his way. I think his his initial entry in that movie when he comes down the ramp of the shuttle but during the assault on the Jakku village, he looks the part. Um, I think it's a bit of a nod to hardcore Star Wars fans that have played the old Knights of the Old Republic game in that it, the mask and the cape and that looks very much like Revan, who's the major pre- protagonist in those games. To be honest, at that moment, I thought, yeah, they've nailed it. He's authentic. This guy looks good. It was, wasn't was until he took the mask off that I got slightly disappointed because I liked him being a mystery. I liked him being a villain. Whilst he's got that mask on, he could be anyone you want to project underneath that mask. Hmm. Then, like you say, once they take it off and he's late 20s 30s something guy with a sort of you know a very reminiscent of Anakin Skywalker type Barnet obviously looks a like more... a Foo Fighters roadie or something yeah I mean surely if he was wanted to pay more of an homage to Darth Vader he'd look a bit more like Sam Neill did at the end of um, Event Horizon he'd <laughs> yeah. be a bit burnt up and charred and crispy from With the, no eyes huh? from the lava well not that far but from the lava <laughs> lava fields of Mustafar type yeah. look to him you know his hair would be gone and that uh, so I found that unintimidating I was a bit disappointed once he took the mask off really but the crimes he went on to commit, I guess, makes him uh, more of a hated figure than with the mask. You know, what he ended up doing in the next film, I guess we're in anticipating how much darker he will become. Yeah, I mean, I, the... Snoke I liked, because even though they didn't mask Snoke, you could see he was clearly disfigured and uh, a very interesting character. Yeah. But like I said, once they unmasked him and he's a bit of a pretty boy, and it just doesn't work. You know, but when whilst he's masked, it does work. I, I like the idea of my villains not having a face, so I can project whatever I like onto them under that mask. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting that they're going to be looking to change some of these things. Um, we sort of speculated before, perhaps is Luke's cane. You know, they've spoken about Luke possibly having a cane. Like I said, this is just other people's reports, so we're not going to say this is gospel, are we? Huh. We're not going to put our names to it. We're just talking about what other people are talking about. But well, Luke having a cane is reminiscent of Yoda being in exile, or if if he has a cane, and so on. So that's where we are with that, really. Yeah, the costume well, in front. I think costumes were always important in the um in the original trilogy, weren't they? Mm-hmm. I mean, and obviously in the prequels as well with uh, Padme and stuff like that. You know, we had some great outfits. I think in the evolution of the characters, uh, Luke's is obviously the the most prominent. You know, how he how he changed from his white white costume in um, A New Hope, and then you know. Uh, in uh, on Hoff in the uh, Empire Strikes Back, then he's a uh, Dagobah outfit, that one, you know, which is yeah, I can just remember it with the um the figures, you know, as as he collected them, the different outfits. Yeah, there was almost like a timeline or a lineage there. I mean, it's fascinating what you say about that because I think you know his original clothing in the in in A New Hope, like you say, it's practical wear that he wears on Tatooine. It's his farm scrubs or whatever you want to call it hot it's, desert he needs yeah. white to reflect the temperature probably for, yeah sort of adobe fashion you know it's yeah. fought through but that's his practical working dress every day it's probably what he wears the whole time or variations on it it's like Jeff Goldblum in the, car- in the fly he's probably yeah. got 11 f- sets of the same clothing <laughs> hanging in his wardrobe like you say episode 8 his clothing is practical military clothing whether it's his flight suit like you say his sort of fatigue like clothes that carries equipment under his belt and what have you on Degamar and Bespin and so on and by the time we see him in Return of the Jedi his clothing is much more reminiscent of the Jedi isn't it I mean yeah he's it's got, just he's dark got, it's yeah. tight yeah, yeah. He's, he's not mucking about at that stage he's ditched a lot of his weapons his blaster and that just to favour his lightsaber I'm not sure about the knee high boots though are they practical I don't know as a Jedi I've never worn knee high boots I've never worn knee high boots but obviously Luke Skywalker pulled them off not I'm, in public yeah not in public I mean when 
this isn't the clove show. I mean, I'm not Jeff Banks and Dave's not Selena Scott, but I mean, we, you know, we've got to have an we opinion. We just need a bit of new order with Blue Monday playing <laughs> in the background here. Um, I can insert that. You can, yeah. Yeah, we'll stick that in All just right. for a laugh. Yeah, but um, yeah, uh, it's interesting to see where it goes, I think, and gives us that little heads up. I mean, I guess we're going to soon start seeing a few promotional photographs, yeah. posters, snips and clips, that kind of thing, and that will either correlate with this or it will dismiss this, won't it? But it's always interesting to have that conversation. What else you got on Star Wars? Well, I've got um, J.J. Abrams' new order, audio commentary on The Force Awakens. Is this for the... 3D. The, yeah, the new uh, is it the new Blu-ray? Yeah, special super swishy Christmas edition. Yeah, 3D presentation. Okay, they make more money out of it re-release. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I want you to pick a number between one and twenty-seven, Dave. Between one and twenty-seven. Is this like a card trick? Well, no, I've just got sort of twenty-seven nice little little comments about the film that you know we may or may not know. I'm not going to go through the whole twenty-seven. Uh, basically, it's in the new uh, December edition of Empire Magazine. So. Okay, I'm going to go for number fourteen. Number fourteen. Okay, uh-huh. let's have a look. See Which if is we crispy notice. fried rice. <laughs> yeah, it is. High sing sauce. Um, Ab- number fourteen. Abrams is excellent on Ray's nightmarish vision of the Force in Maz Kanata's castle, calling it the Force back. He reveals Ray was at one point meant to see Vader fighting Luke on Cloud City. We wanted it to be more a personal story. Well, there is that very brief scene of a few frames there, and it looks like Ray is standing within a corridor on Cloud City. Mm-hmm. So obviously some of that is still going through. And hopefully it may show up, show up one day. These things are always fascinating. Because yeah. it's almost like telling you what the director's full vision is, and you can kind of see how that plays in what you get in the film. Because obviously you never get the full vision, do you? No, that's right. Scenes get cut, practical reasons, cost reasons, what have you. It's always difficult when we, when we're doing dream sequences or visions. You just see the the actor like looking into the distance, kind of thing. And you yeah. have in a novel, you can you can read what they're thinking. In in a film, it's really difficult to show, isn't it? Mm. So okay, do you want to do another one? Yeah, write one opening crawl. No, cool. I mean one of these. <laughs> oh, I've got another another nugget. We're such pros on this show. <laughs> okay, sweet seventeen. Seventeen. Let's have a look. Seventeen. The director constantly praises John Williams' score, reserving special praise for his March of the Resistance theme. Abrams reveals Williams presented him with a leather-bound leather copy of that particular score as a gift after the movie was complete. Okay, one last one. Okay. Seems as we're playing Star Wars bingo here, let's go for Legs 11. Why? Steven Spielberg suggested that after Finn watches the TIE fighter get sucked into the sand by an unseen Jakku beastie, it should suddenly explode. That would have been funnier. Yeah. If bits of guts and stuff would have flown up and stuff as well. Well, I read a lot about um, Poe Dameron as well, that he was supposed to perish in that moment. Well, he clearly ejected, landed, and there's a backstory. There, there, there's an entire expanded universe to explain to us what's happened to Poe Dameron there. Isn't yeah, that's there? right. He ejected, managed to get off planet somewhere, left Finn there with his jacket, lucky to get his jacket back. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a good scene. I just put that down to um, quicksand or something. Yeah. You know, it's just landed in the wrong area geographically or something like that, but it's a great scene. Well, you can read those um, other, how many other, other 24 of those tidbits from uh, the new commentary in a December edition of Empire Magazine if you wish to purchase it it's available now yeah good scoop okay let's get back to the one I've jumped the gun on Rogue One opening crawl according to the Twitter feed of Star Wars News Net dated the 3rd of November 2016 Rogue One a Star Wars story will not have an opening crawl there's a picture of the Twitter feed does Rogue One need an opening crawl to remain Star Wars or do they need to perhaps change the formula a little bit for a spin-off movie. I was thinking about this this morning. Um, when, when we look at the um, the cartoons, like you know, Rebels, Clone Wars, things like that, we don't have the open and crawl every episode, do we? No. But uh, if you look at anything like the sort of Clone Wars and stuff, we get a variation of existing Star Wars theme music to open it. I'll admit it's a different composer's rendition. It's Kevin Kiner's. And we still get the traditional Star Wars font in the title and the way it comes up against the background. So it's still, it's a variation on the Star Wars theme. Like you say, it, it misses the um, opening crawl. Perhaps we don't need it. Perhaps they should have a more sombre opening. Yeah. Maybe a fa- more of a fading opening, which, you know, 
my cat's now decided to ruin the production process on this podcast. See, Dave promised we were much more polished. <laughs> no more cats running across pianos. <laughs> Excuse me one moment. Right, right you. Yeah, Angie, get the flying <laughs> cat out of here. Right, that's dealt with that situation. Where were we? Oh, yes, the Rogue One opening crawl. You know, I thought... Now you can hear my cat ringing her bell outside the door. She's angry. Yeah, good. Um, we, <laughs> yeah. I had this whole thing with The Force Awakens. Would I miss the 20th Century Fox opening, the fanfare and the searchlights and all this stuff? Because to me, every up to that point, every Star Wars film has that opening as part of the, you know, da, 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 and then it, a long time ago, and the galaxy far, far away, and we're off. To me, it's all part of that intro to the film, and I'm a big fan of intros and stuff, as you well know, Mark. I like them well done. So when it transitioned to Disney, and obviously the Fox fanfare was not going to be a part of the start of the film, we just went straight into the crawl, I worried that I would miss the fanfare, and I didn't. No. It was fine, I was fine, just going straight into a long time galaxy and, and the crawl. But this isn't even going to have the Fox fanfare, and if this story is right, and we're not saying it's right, again, it's just another source on the internet, it's not going to have the cruel either. I think it'll be missed. The cruel will be missed. If it's a Star Wars film, it should have the cruel. I, th- I think it should. We should have some kind of, uh, you know, that sort of prologue that they, they bring up. Yeah. And I think it's always um, a, a nice intro to the movie. It, it goes back to the old Saturday morning matinees, matinees like George Lucas wanted to base it on, you know. Yeah. It's, um, I think it also it colours the world a little bit. Mm. You know, it gives you the political picture, the background of what's going on in a very simple condensed form that, you, okay, this is the world we're in, now let's watch the film. I liked it in the crawls as well with the, the capitals, you know, to help you know what, what are important moments in the, in the plot. Yeah. yeah, and nowadays they'd put hashtags in it. Yeah, they probably would, yeah. Yeah, oh, this stuff's a lingo I'm not familiar with. Just put it in English, please. Yeah, that's all I've got, really. Okay, well, quite a lot in Star Wars, really, this week, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've managed to kill a good bit of time with that. I have actually got one more. Have you? Cinematographer Bradford Young spoke about team, teaming up with directors Christopher Miller and Phil Lord for the up-and-coming Han Solo film. It's going to feel like a Star Wars film, but we're definitely going to break some rules, and we're encouraged to do that. Lucasfilm is allowing them to do something completely different. Mm-hmm. As we know, the, the guys who directed the um, Lego movie, an up-and-coming Batman Lego movie. Um, so, I mean, I hope people do push it in new directions. I mean, that's what we've seen already with The Force Awakens, isn't it? We were talked about this before, about different camera angles and seeing ships and things from another side. And, I, yeah, I hope they can t- continue to do that. But, I mean... Puts that new take on a universe that we already feel familiar with. Yeah, and the, the more directors that get involved, cinematographers, I think um, it just expands what we already know and love. Man, I mean, great things come from people experimenting and trying new things. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it won't work, sometimes it works brilliantly, but unless they're prepared to try it, you're not going to know either way. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, let's hope so. Okay, that's it for Star Wars news then. Yeah, that's pretty much all we've got on that for this this week. Um, uh, any thoughts on what we've talked about? Get back to us. Yeah, and um, if you know a little more, if you know someone who knows someone mm-hmm. working behind the scenes... Yeah, don't turn around to us and say, no, that's not what's going to happen, this will happen, because like I said, we're only reporting what other people are reporting as a talking point. Yeah. So if we're wrong, we're wrong. But that's that's kind of comes with the hot womba turf. Should we get on with Showcase? The Showcase, okay. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to hear some serious sh**. This is Hot Wampa. Showcase this week is um, the Andromeda Strain, the 1971 version, not the novel or the modernised um, series, because I think they released a series, didn't they? A few years 2008, back. yeah, it was yeah. Um, a mini series with Benjamin Bratt. It was three hours long, it's rated 15 mm-hmm. certificate, 6.2 on IMDb, so not really a great response. I think that's probably what the film's worth, yeah, to be honest with you. The Andromeda Strain is a 1971 American science fiction film produced and directed by Robert Wise, based on Michael Crichton's 1969 novel of the same name and adopted by Nelson Giddin. 
The film stars Arthur Hill, James Olsen, Kate Reed and David Wayne as a team of scientists who investigate a deadly organism of extraterrestrial origin. With a few exceptions, the film follows the book closely. The special effects were designed by Douglas Trumbull. The film is notable for its use of split screen in certain scenes. Two crew members of the US government's Project Scoop investigate the town of Piedmont, New Mexico to retrieve the Scoop 7 satellite. They find townspeople dead in the streets while reporting back to Scoop Mission Control suspecting the satellite may have brought back an extraterrestrial pathogen. Scoop Mission Control activates an elite scientific team it had previously recruited for just this type of emergency. Nobel laureate Dr Jeremy Stone, played by Arthur Hill, the team leader and Dr. Mark Hall, played by James Olsen, the team surgeon, are dropped in Piedmont by helicopter, where they search the town for Scoop 7 in hazmat suits. They find the town's doctor who died after opening the satellite out of curiosity. Always a bad idea. Yeah, it kills the cat, and that, so they say. Yeah, I sort of nearly killed my cat there. <laughs> Hall cuts open the doctor's corpse and finds that all of his blood is clotted and turned to powder. Stone and Hall retrieve Scoop 7 and find two survivors. A 62-year-old man and an infant who can't be more than six months old. The entire team of four core research scientists, including Dr. Charles Dutton, played by David Wayne, and Dr. Ruth Levitt, played by Kate Reed, are summoned from their academic and research appointments to arrive at a top-secret high-tech underground laboratory in Nevada named Wildfire, where they undergo a full day of decontamination procedures, descending through five rigorous disinfection levels of the lab. Before decontamination, Hall is informed that the facility's nuclear device has been armed and will go off automatically within five minutes should there be a containment breach. He is entrusted with a key to disarm the bomb from designated substations within that window. The team enter the facility under the impression that Piedmont has already been sterilised by a nuclear bomb. The team begins to experiment on the agent inside Scoop 7 and discovers that it is transmitted by air kills lab animals instantly and is too large to be a virus. After searching the satellite with a high-powered microscope, they discover the agent responsible for the deaths, a greenish throbbing mass stowed away on a micrometeorite. It receives the code name Andromeda. While most of the team studies the agent in an attempt to figure out how it works, Hall tries to find a cure by figuring out why the old man and the baby survived. Both Hall and his nurse assistant work in encapsulating suits while in the contaminated hot room. By analysing their patient's blood and conferring with Peter Jackson, the old man, played by George Mitchell, they discover that he is abnormally acidic blood from drinking squeeze, or sterno, to relieve his stomach ulcer. No anomalies are found within the baby. Meanwhile, a fighter jet pilot flying over Piedmont at high altitude notices his rubber mouthpiece disintegrating. He then loses consciousness and crashes. The military inspects the wreck and finds that the pilot's flesh has dissolved, leaving only bones. While discussing the pilot's claims that all the rubber was dissolving, they are told there is no actual rubber aboard a Phantom F-4. Instead, the material is polychron, a synthetic substance with properties similar to human skin. Unknown to others, Leavitt's research is impaired by attacks of absence epilepsy, which is set off by the flashing red no-growth indicator on the Petri dish analyzer. This causes her to report erroneously that Andromeda grows on every growth medium. During chemical study of the agent, the team finds out that the meteorite is in fact made of plastic and that the green mass is a life form of similar chemical composition to Earth's life. However, it lacks amino acids, enzymes or proteins. They then discover that Piedmont has in fact not yet been bombed due to the caution of the president and that a fighter flying over Piedmont crashed. They again insist the bomb be dropped. Further studies of Andromeda, however, reveals that it has a crystalline structure which allows it to convert energy to mass and vice versa, consuming any available resource without waste. They deduce that a nuclear explosion would provide Andromeda with enough energy to produce a super colony in a single day. Reversing their opinion, they now insist that Piedmont bombing be stopped. During analysis, the team comes across a germ warfare simulation indicating that Scoop and Wildfire were designed to actively search for harmful biological agents for use in bio-warfare. Meanwhile, Andromeda mutates into a form that degrades synthetic rubber and plastics and thus escapes from the containment room adjacent to where Dutton is working, trapping him in an atmosphere laced with the agent. Hall rescues Levitt from a photosensitive epilepsy seizure triggered by Wildfire's alarm system. 
Hall continues his work on the survivors and found, finds out that the Andromeda propagates only within a narrow pH range and that the baby's rapid breathing kept his blood alkaline and then therefore inhospitable for the organism. Jackson's blood, suffering from acidosis, was just the opposite. Its low pH also made it inhospitable for the organism. He advises Dutton to breathe rapidly as well, but then observes a rat in good health alongside Dutton, meaning that the organism has mutated and become benign to terrestrial life. Almost immediately, after Stone notes that problems with gasket deterioration at the lunar lab induced them to use polychron for the gaskets in wildfire, Andromeda starts decaying all of the lab seals, activating the nuclear self-destruct countdown and trapping the team on the fifth or the lowest level. Hall races against the clock to reach a substation with his key. With the door sealed, he climbs ladders in a maintenance access core and endures an attack by automated lasers intended to stop escaped lab animals, until at last he finds a working third level substation, disables the bomb and passes out. The military then begins seeding the clouds over the desert with silver iodide, stimulating precipitation which washes the organism into the ocean where they believe it will be destroyed by the alkalinity of salt water. A federal board concludes that the crisis is over, but Stone somberly asks what may happen if such a situation were to recur. The film ends up with a close-up of the virus as it mutates again, causing the computer to overload, showing that Andromeda remains unpredictable. Hmm. Might as well just watch the film in the time that took. Yeah, well, it was a good synopsis, so... Yeah, pretty detailed. What do we think? Well, I can tell you what I, I thought when I first saw it, and, and I don't even know if I got through the whole thing when I was, like, I don't know, 11 or 12. It was one of those films that you knew was science fiction, mm -hmm. but firmly rooted in science fact. And that was one of the, the main points that people wanted to see, I think, that it, was, it wasn't just, you know, green men from outer space. It was a green blob from outer space. However, that didn't make it the most exciting film to watch, as there was no enemy as such to, you know, to go up against. It was a, it was a virus, or, you know, or some sort of microorganism. It feels a bit like to me like one of the first documentary dramas. Yeah. That this thing comes down and you follow the process from the the satellite being found in this village or this pavement, where it is, right through to this thing becoming benign. Or hopefully benign, but as the as the synopsis reads, it, it mutates. So we don't know if it's still benign, and we see all the scientific steps between the two. Um, Andromeda Strain, I think, can be a bit of a heavy watch because a lot of it is people talking in rooms, it's people looking at monitors. While the concept of it is familiar to us today, it does look of its time. And you've got that sort of typical sort of, I don't know. Atari 800 types computer screens and you know I, there's a few times I thought I would see Pac-Man walking across and start eating the uh, representations of Andromeda on the screen being chased by ghosts and stuff looks very dated a lot of the um, cast appeared in like 60s, 70s sort of early sci-fi um, and The Invaders was one of the series that lots of them appeared in and The Invaders was well, particularly my, one of my mum's favourites it was an ongoing series and and the style looked very similar to that, mm -hmm. like a TV movie. Um, two hundred and eleven, uh, two two hours eleven minutes long. Yeah, it's quite a long running time. It is, yeah, it's a bit of a meal to get through Andromeda Strain, isn't it? Yeah, but uh, nominated for two Oscars. Yeah, best art direction and best film editing, and nominated for a Golden Globe for best score by Gil Mel. Oh, the sets. And the look of it and the editing, I think, in Drama the Strain is very good. Yeah. yeah but the, I think the way it, it moves from scene to scene is seamless. I think the split scene thing, which at that time was probably quite a new concept, it works okay. Yeah. I'm not off-put by it. No, I liked it. I mean, I think it was used in the Mission Impossible TV series back then. Yeah. But also, um, recently, in Ang Lee's The Hulk or uh, Ant-Man, things like the comic book movies are using that more and more. And that makes sense because comic yeah. book plates, you know, it works really well. But I thought in this year it's a very good idea. Yeah. I think um, if we can give Andromeda Strain credit for anything, it's forward thinking. Because Michael Crichton had obviously done his homework and wanted his story to have a bit of credibility. It was rooted in the real world, wasn't it? And yeah, very much so. And a logical way this thing perhaps might play out. I mean, I don't know if the American government has some sort of buried facility that concentrates on this sort of stuff. Possibly. Possibly. I would so I would say, yeah, in reality, they probably do, don't they? They have a couple of places like this. They're bound to. 
Um, I, I was blown away. I, I went through the cast and everything and had a look through through the careers. But the, the one person that stood out was Robert Wise, the director. Mm-hmm. Now I didn't know a lot about Robert Wise before. I thought it it's might not a name that jumps, is it? No, I thought it might have been a one-hit wonder. Yeah. But this guy directed um, the Day the Earth Stood Still, a classic mm-hmm. sci-fi film, uh, West Side Story, The Sound of Music, and Star Trek: The Motion Picture. You know. Oh. So so those films. I mean, particularly the musicals, which aren't my cup of tea, but, no. but made millions and millions for the studios. Mm. You know. So, uh, but I mm-hmm. never heard of Robert Wise really before investigating this. Oh, yeah, I mean, I didn't. I never associated him with those. No, I thought the day the Earth is still and Star Wars the motion picture would ring a bell. Yeah, but yeah, um, it was rated G, and it, the tagline was like rated G, maybe too intense for younger children. No, this isn't for children, is it? It's well, it's not. A, would my six-year-old sit there and watch the intro? No. Of course you wouldn't, because it's boring. Yeah, that's that's the main. So they might be, we might be fascinated watching them and watching them going through the process of working this thing out, but a child's not going to, is it? No, that's right. To them, it's just a lot of talk in front of monitors and in various labs and offices and, and people things. staring at lights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like um, what's it, Doctor Ruth? Leave it, and yeah. just uh, when you know, before we find out she's got epilepsy, you're wondering whether somehow the Andromeda. St- strain has taken over her or something because she's, she's just, been possessed yeah just staring at her, her red flashing like so that was a bit strange yeah uh, uh, budgetary wise uh, six and a half million dollars so I guess which was quite a lot of money back then oh yeah um, and then we had uh, the gross of uh, nearly twelve and a half million so it made mm-hmm. you know, doubled its money and uh, in rentals alone it made eight point two million dollars so rentals you know this early v- VHS I guess beta max 1971, 72, etc. So, yeah. And, uh, so, commercially, it did okay. Yeah, and, and this was, I guess, the the start of Michael Crichton's run, really, you know, because Westworld. This came, is pre Westworld, yeah. yeah. Westworld came out a year later, didn't it? Yeah. So, you know, then he's starting to make films and getting people to stand up and take note of him. Yeah, maybe this is one of the first sort of credible things and people looked at and thought, yeah, actually, it's pretty good or what have you. Um, but if you've got somebody there that's got a a sort of hidden form of photosensitive epilepsy. Is it good to have everything in that sort of 70s psychedelic palette where mm-hmm. things flash red and all the rest of it in front of her? Particularly the, yeah, the end of the film was very psychedelic with the, where we see the mutation, don't we? You know, this kind of... It goes on for like, I don't know, 40 seconds and it's very, very trippy in a way. What do you think they would use to represent Andromeda today? In those graphics? It would take over somebody who would have white eyes and would be trying to eat people. What do you think it would look like through a microscope today? Do you think they'd still go through the sort of crystalline? That makes sense. That makes sense. And I mean, from a scientific point of view, that's probably a good way. I yeah. mean, when you see a lot of, um, like, looking under the microscope, these things are in spreading incredibly quick and growing and multiplying. In reality, it would probably be like the Andromeda strain. That, that's something that a lot of people, even scientists, have said, that the science fact in this film is superb. Yeah, well, where did this meteorite come from? They say it's, it's, it's got a chemical composition of plastics. As we know, plastics are a petrochemical. It's basically the end of a, a lot of processes, but it starts out as dead dinosaurs and trees. Yeah. It's um, a, a fossil element. So a plastic wouldn't be floating around in space. No. Well, it it's, probably it's, is now. It's in, well, there's no end of rubbish we've sent up yeah, there. Yeah, space in debris. Yeah. Um, so is that something that's been you know it can't be a natural meteorite right? no it's got to be something that an intelligence has put there or fired through space like you say it's, it's come off a rocket or something like that perhaps maybe um, an alien race used it to consume the unused plastic bags <laughs> he, <laughs> he didn't did want to a, play the 5p at Tesco yeah he did a great job and they're like right we've got no more plastic it's going to start eating people let's send it out into space what with a virus on it yeah that's just petty, though. I know. That's that's fly tipping on a grand grand scale, really, isn't it? Yeah. Should we get a third opinion? Yeah, let's should have we, a look. Should we have a read of the Dean Shepherd review? Let's do it. We got this one in advance. It was a film that was on Film 4, so our listeners had a chance to catch up on the Andromeda strain, have a rewatch, have a refresh before we talked about it. And Dean Shepherd was the first to put his hand up in the class. But he's in sync, though, isn't he? He is in sync. Um, we've been watching... Um, Interstellar recently, isn't he? And he's been yeah. watching that too. Yeah. Whatever we watch, Dean seems to watch. So. He's got a bug in here, never mind Lucasfilm. Yeah, he thinks we're spying on him. I think he's spying on us. I don't know. But anyway, 
uh, Dean was kind enough to respond to our calls, and he, he's got his the Dean Shepherd review, and he's, he's done us several reviews now, hasn't he? I think we can make a compendium of Dean's reviews. Yeah, but they're always good. They're always well written, and they're always good fun to read. So let's have a look at what Dean's had to say. Came to us yesterday, Friday the 4th of November. Greetings once again, Hawk Wampa Crew, and thanks for choosing the Andromeda Strain as your showcase. This may be the first film you've covered, largely down to not being born when released. Well, you know, me and Mark weren't born when this was released. No. This is 1971. This is, I mean, we might be a couple of old guys, but this is pre our existence, which I haven't seen. And what an intriguing film it is. It is a film which, if made today, would undoubtedly be totally different. The scenes largely consist of four people and their attempts to deal with an alien pathogen which wiped out a whole town and the moral Im- implications of dealing with said strain. I doubt that the majority of today's audience would perhaps have the patience and desire to see such a film without the promise of big names behind it and a multitude of special effects laid in action scenes. I, however, enjoyed the pace and the intrigue and is a fine example of a story, given substance to a film largely down to everyone's favourite sci-fi writer, Michael Crichton. I see elements in the film which reminded me of other movies and can see the influences that the Andromeda strain may have had. The base where the team are detained remind me of the Hive from Resident Evil, both in an appearance and in the ability to contain a virus which ultimately gets out of control. The paranoia element has a hint of the film Outbreak and the use of split screen may have influenced many other films and the series 24. Good point there. I couldn't really pick any holes in the plot itself as the science behind it all seemed reasonably plausible, so found small criticisms elsewhere instead. The technology on show seems dated, well this is 71, and somewhat laughable, which is not the movie's fault. The acting at times can be a little ropey, and I did object slightly to the gratuitous and numerous shots of old man's buttocks in the first third of the film. It kicks kicks off nicely in the final third, and we know that the key that Dr. Hall has been given to initiate an atomic explosion would come into play, and I particularly like the odd man hypothesis determining that he is the person best suited to decide or as it transpires to halt the seemingly inevitable nuclear explosion. Given Dr. Leavitt the choice may have been an option seen as despite the only woman seemed to have the biggest balls, metaphorically speaking. Yeah, she's a hawk, she'd have set it off. All in good film, that's not Dean's words, that's my interjection there. All in all, a good film made the right way. And standing the test of time, and thankfully at this present time, just a movie. And on that sobering thought, farewell. Thanks Dean. Well written again. Yeah, some some good uh, information. I, I I agree with um what he said about um Kate Reed, Doctor Ruth Leavitt. I mean, she wasn't in the novel. In the novel, the character of Leavitt is a man, but um in the film, as a woman. I guess to sort of mix it up a bit. You think? Yeah. But there's no sort of male or female chemistry dynamic to the film. They're all professional scientists, though, don't they? I get that impression that there is no possible romantic inclination or over friendly inclination or any of that sort of gender exchange banter between her and the other scientists so I get the impression really that they're all just getting on with the job yeah I agree but somebody is I think it was Nelson Giddin who decided to change it slightly just to make it more sort of um, I don't know, add, a, add a female element to it I mean we've also got Karen Anson haven't we the um, the sort of uh, the medical orderly the nurse yeah, yeah played by Paula Kelly yeah um, she's got quite. A, I mean, she was in Solent Green as well, so uh, she's got quite good-looking a good, girl. Yeah, really good. That's when you know that old man's feeling better when he grabs a hold of her. My favourite line of the film: "Hell of a way to run a hospital." Yeah, <laughs> he's a, he. I quite like that guy. He does give it a little bit of comedic human relief, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. Like a bit where he, they're talking to the two of them on the monitor, and his head pops up, and is yeah. that when he says That's that? It. Yeah, yeah, great. His yeah. hair's all sticky. It looks a bit like Doc Brown out yeah, of Back yeah. to the Future all over the place. Yeah, I'm not being funny, but if I had a stomach ulcer in my sixties and I was in there, he's obviously not in the best of health. He's probably feeling a bit under the weather, and they put him in with a hungry six-month-old infant. He's that, crying. That, that's yeah. hell. Yeah, it is hell. I, I just if. if yeah, I think if I was, it might be want to be away in some quiet, dark room somewhere, just a mattress and you know, comfortable temperature ambience. Don't put me in with a screaming brat. If I've got an alien disease, I want a bit of peace and quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had a six-month-old. I'm a parent, and that thing in the night when they get hungry or they wet the bed or they just start crying, and it's just you want you just want to fast forward twenty years and they're off your hands. You know what I mean? You want peace and quiet again. So if you're feeling down and rough in that moment, the last thing you want is a screaming child there. So put it in a different room. I'd ask them to put it in a different room. Um, interesting what Dave said about. Um, sorry, what Dean said. 
um, about the, um, the the film influencing other things. It, it was featured in Twelve Monkeys, um, so that you could see it in one of, on a, one of the television screens. Yeah. Um, obviously, we covered Twelve Monkeys in the past. Yeah. Uh, but in the seventies and eighties, they used to edit a lot of films into other films and TV series to save yeah. a bit of money. And this one had been edited into the Six Million Dollar Man. The Bionic Woman, Buck Rogers in the 25th century. It was 25th century, or was it 23rd century? Can't remember. Anyway, and Knight Rider. Star Trek was the 23rd century. Yeah, was it? Yeah, because that always Star Trek too. Raph Khan opens that way in the 23rd century. Okay. Well, yeah. anyway, so, so it was edited into these films. They were used. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got some other facts here. Michael Crichton was invited to take a tour of Universal Studios during the production of this film. His guide was none other than a young Steven Spielberg. There you go. Six degrees of separation. Yeah. Six, yeah. Can you link him to Kevin Bacon? Um, Kevin Bacon. Da, 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 da. Who? Spielberg or Crichton? Uh, Crichton. Crichton. We, we've played Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon before on this show. That's where this is coming from. So it might seem a bit of a left field thing for me to say. I'm trying to think of um, Outbreak, the other film that um, Dean mentioned, which was good with Kevin Spacey. Dustin Hoffman, um, Rene Rousseau, those kind of things. Perhaps that's one for our listeners. Yeah, please, if you can. Michael I'm, Crichton I'm, to Kevin Bacon in Six Degrees. Yeah, it must. I'm, I don't think he stayed in, uh, starred in the film. That but, should be straightforward for someone. It should be, shouldn't it? It should yeah. be straightforward for me. Dave's put me on the spot again. Well, he, yeah, well, perhaps Mark, when Mark had the Andromeda strain last time we recorded, so perhaps there's a bit of a hang-up there. I was on the toilet for three days. Yeah. <laughs> um... There's a line in it, let's go back to The Rock and see it at 4.40. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was sampled in a, um, a song by a band called Apollo 440. Do you remember them? Um, they sang Ain't Talking About Dub. Mm. Ain't Talking About Dub. Anyway, right. this is sort of sampled in that. So, um, well, it means at 4.40, it doesn't mean go back and see it at 20 to 5 in the evening. It means at 4.40 magnification, I That's think. That's right. Yeah. Um, In September 1972, Universal was exhibiting uh, this film on a double bill with Airport. You remember Airport? Oh, what a lineup! Yeah, Yeah. and and it was under the tagline "Together on One Great Family Program." Why don't they just mash both films up with a little bit of that seventies editing that you were talking about, and have the Andromeda Strain break out on an airliner? (laughs) Yeah, that would be good, wouldn't it? That's a great film. You could have shakes on a plane. Um, the Wildfire Lab um, cost more than three hundred thousand dollars to build, and right. it was really accurate apparently because um, the director Robert Wise wanted uh, real instruments used, yeah, proper scientific stuff, and uh, so it was, a, it was almost a working lab. So yeah, really good. Uh, no, we've got to give it chops for that. I think in terms of scientific accuracy, I think like I said earlier on, Michael Crichton's done his homework. You know, it might not be spot on, or it might not be with today's techniques, but I think yeah, it's credible. Um, James Olsen, who played Dr. Mark Hall, who's kind of, I guess, the hero of the piece. Pretty uh, much. Um, he starred in The Bionic Woman, Battlestar Galactica, the old series, mm-hmm. and Project UFO, which is a series I never really watched. But um, No, I never really watched it. Um, but an interesting link to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Go on. Uh, James Olsen played Major General Franklin Kirby in the 1985 Schwarzenegger film Commando. Commando. Yeah, so mm-hmm. there you go. Nice little link there. Uh, David Wayne, who played Dr. Charles Dutton, mm-hmm. had the same birthday as actor Charles S. Dutton. Well, the who would have known the that? the third Alien film. Yeah, how about that? Little coincidences stay happen all the time when we get into these. The more we do, the more we find. Yeah. Uh, people asking, on, I found a lot on Rot- Rotten Tomatoes, people saying, is this the most accurate sci-fi film ever made? Others said it's too literal and talky. Some said nothing exciting goes on. Another question, how old are the cast? And one person just put disquieting in. I don't think, I think a lot of those people aren't necessarily getting it for what the film is. No. I think there is a degree of... I don't think the acting in this film is too bad. I don't think there's that... a few ropey moments when like the part when they're discuss, discussing the morality of um, dropping the bomb and also the fact that it turns out it's a bio warfare lab and I think they call up charts on some computer screens of bio warfare maps and how they would affect the country 
and there's those ethical moral moments where I think the acting doesn't necessarily hold up very well like when the the doctor is trying to convince whoever it is the politician to convince in turn the president to drop the bomb over Piedmont I didn't buy all that I did buy the acting during the scientific discussion when they're actually they look like they're people that are more comfortable as scientists than everyday people when they're in a lab environment and they're at consoles or they're looking for an electron microscope or they're discussing or theorizing there's a bit when the medical doctor guy gets quite animated when he's trying to work out what the connection is between the baby's condition and the old man's condition but the condition is being complete opposites all of that acting I thought was very credible the scientific side of the acting well like I said the moral side of the acting I thought was a bit poor I think the actors as we said in, in your um, synopsis that they're, they're kind of unknown actors to the m- major sort of TV audience film audiences yeah. however they were working actors who have been in a number of TV and film and you know and, and done their, their parts over the years yeah so I agree. The age, to me, the age of the actors in it made them seem more authentic, made them seem more believable, I guess. Well, that they would be credible, experienced scientists that perhaps have won a few prizes for achievements and discoveries down a year. Exactly. And so, so this is part of the problem. Today they would have the the role of... Ben Affleck or something like that. Yeah, alongside... I don't know, Rihanna or something like that, and you're supposed to believe that she's been, you know, some top nuclear scientist for 40 years, and it wouldn't be viable, would it? No. Just to get bums on seats in cinemas. We're lucky they didn't put, like, uh, I don't know, Michael Caine in this one, you know, something like that. Yeah. This sort of era, you know. If you had to make the Andromeda the Strain today, who'd be the four actors, actresses that you would choose for your scientists? Okay, Jeff Goldblum. Okay. Definitely. Um, Who else? I don't know, someone like Annette Benning, you know, sort of an older lady who, who's, who's a good actress. Um, I guess you would have a younger actor, like someone like Matt Damon, who isn't that young anymore, but someone of, what, a younger of them. And a fourth one, I don't know, Donald Sutherland. Would you? Yeah, someone like that, a nice little... I couldn't take him seriously as a scientist, because to me he'll always be oddball. Yeah. So, but, um, yeah, okay. Someone like that. Uh, any different would you choose? Well, who would I choose? You would choose Kevin Bacon just so we could cheer him in this film. Yeah, I'd make that easy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Kevin Bacon's on the team. Um, who else would I choose other than Kevin Bacon? Who's the stereotypical TV scientist? TV. Uh, Brent Spiner. Yep, yeah, okay. That's two. Who? And I need to get two more. Do I need to have a female? You don't need to. No, okay. okay, just to throw it into this mix even further, I'd have Judy Dench. Judy Dent. She right. might even be my lead or project scientist. Indeed. That'd be my female scientist. Okay, good. And I need I need one more, don't I? Yep. Who else would make my um, actor's dream team for the Andromeda strain? Oh, very good. Uh, just to come completely out of left field and make absolutely no sense, Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg. Well, he's, he's done that, hasn't he? Benji in Mission Impossible. He's, he's kind of like the tech guy. Yeah. And I guess um, Scotty in a modern Star Trek film. So, yeah, yeah, I think he would... So he can fit. deliver the babble. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. There's my modern Andromeda okay, strain okay. lineup. We should have a, an Andromeda off, and we should have our four scientists against each other. Yeah, Andromeda Wars. Like, we've, we've made this film, which could be a, like a talk film, much more interesting all of a sudden. Yeah, it could be like Top Trumps with an Andromeda strain. Yeah, yeah. Good on you. Yeah, good idea that. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Robert Wise ser- served as president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Yeah, yeah. So you know, he he had a distinguished career. They, they probably are quite distinguished actors. Like you said, they were quite prolific actors of that era. Yeah, but you know, they're kind of in their own sort of niche, really. Sadly, so, a few of them went downhill and ended up in Dallas and things like that. Oh no. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, a majority of the people we're talking about today are no longer with us. Well, yeah. I mean, um, what is it? Arthur Hill, 20, uh, 1922, 2006. He, he lived quite late. Yeah. Um, well, David Wayne, 1914, 1995. Kate Reed, 1930 to 1993. Uh, uh, George Mitchell, who was the old guy, Jackson, died in 1972. So just like a year after this was released. Andromeda got him. Yeah. At Mutated. Uh, it was true. Well, but you have to think, though, this film is 45 years old. Yeah. You know, if if we live to be ninety, which is good, this is half your lifetime. 
Yeah. So that, these a lot of these were older or middle aged people at the time of filming. That's that's an inevitable consequence. That being said, Dave, I mean that says a lot about modern film, doesn't it? That someone like George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, they're, they're in their fifties. Yeah. You know, and these people were probably in their forties. Yeah. But they look a lot older than the modern actors that we see. Yeah, I think people age differently, but then back when they didn't, you know. Most people smoke, then most people drink. The diets wasn't as good. They probably the benefits of exercise and modern living weren't understood the way we were. I mean, we do see a progression in life expectancies, and I think we have also seen a progression in the way people age. Perhaps people moisturise more and stuff like that. Well, I don't know. They say things like fifty is a new thirty, and so I think it is. Perhaps because I'm getting older myself, mm. but when I think of looking at someone who's fifty today, they don't seem as old as someone who was fifty, let's say, twenty years ago. I don't know what it is, Dave, but when I sit down to, to use the toilet these days, I mean, I wear glasses, but I don't know why. I always take my glasses off before. I mean, what do I expect to happen while I'm doing it? I don't know why. I, I always sit there right glasses off, you know, like, like I'm in a crash <laughs> position or something like that. Strain. Yeah, put, so, put your head between your legs and brace. Yeah, no, I think that's the, that is the Andromeda strain. Um, I don't know why I do that. Um, what else have we got any more information here um, yeah um, I read Empire Magazine's uh, review today they gave it four stars which I think we're going to go less than four stars I think probably but yeah the, the one, one line that I read that I thought was a really good one was um, why isn't Crichton concoct the most absorbing riveting take on science fiction tempered with science fact so yeah I agree with that it is a nice concoction of the two yeah or well, you could probably play that the way around though you could say it was science fact tempered with a little bit of science fiction. Yeah. Because I think it does have a credible look. It tries to be intelligent. I like Michael Crichton's writing does. Yeah, I've I read a few of his books. And, I think you're left with the possibility that it could be something much more fantastical, but it comes back to being explained. That's what I like about Michael Crichton. He well, doesn't insult me. It doesn't patronise me. Michael Crichton was probably influenced by people like Ray Bradbury and things like that, you know, back yeah. in those early days. I mean, obviously, Michael Crichton was a doctor himself, so he was an intelligent guy. So, you know, and he, he must have been very young when he wrote The Andromeda Strain, because I believe he was only in his 30s when he directed Westworld. Yeah. And this, he wrote The Andromeda Strain four years prior to directing Westworld. So he's perhaps even in, only in his late 20s or something when he wrote it. And it shows how, you know... Nobody stumbled upon this book. I think it was already groundbreaking back then, yeah, yeah. and he was probably pushed quite quickly up the up the chain. Like this guy's got good ideas; he can uh, he can write good stories. And then mm. you know, as you said in Westworld, he was directing. You yeah, know, just right. thrown straight in. I'm like Kevin W. Well, Paul W. S. Anderson. Sorry, who we were talking about the other week from Event Horizon. Yeah, who was probably of a similar age when he started directing films and writing stories and stuff. And I think Crichton miles ahead of him. Yeah. To be honest with you. Yeah. Um, one last um, word. This was also from Empire. It was a moral statement of the movie. Science must be subservient to mankind. Well, so. science has always been subservient to mankind. It's just that what mankind's used it for. Yeah. I mean, they split the atom, unlimited energy, fantastic. People can have heat and light who have never had it before, but unfortunately they got perversed into splitting fissile material for a bomb. Scientists, science has always been subservient to mankind. Is the fact that mankind has been perverse often and how he's used that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree. Science is a good thing. It's found us cures for illnesses. It's improved our quality of life. It's improved our understanding and our knowledge. Unfortunately, it's also made it a lot easier to do some of the more despicable things that human beings do. I think it was, wasn't that Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park when he said uh, we didn't think about whether we should... We always speculate whether we could, you know, and never say... Whether that there should. should always be moral ethics applied to science. Yeah. But then how far do you extend those moral ethics? I mean, you could argue a lot of the science around pregnancy and reproduction, we've got things like the contraceptive pill, it's possible to abort a fetus, it's possible in the case of a medical emergency to perform a cesarean and deliver a perfectly healthy child and have a perfectly healthy mother afterwards. All of this has come from science and understanding research has come from a logical process and you might have religious lobbies that want to interject and say that that's morally wrong, but they're not morally right to do that. But you do, you know, you can't take somebody who thinks something is scripture, a fairy tale from a book written thousands of years ago. It's not credible. 
but you do have to have an ethical approach to science. I agree. And I mean, look at life expectancy and mortality. You know how things have changed you know, since yeah. the Andromeda strain. You know, how many people have, have lived lo- a longer life, you know, due to, you know, medical advances, scientific advances. So. And most of us probably will and have a better quality of life in that duration. One, one fact that always blows my mind is that there are more people living in the world today than have ever lived before. Yeah. And that's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But we're all descended from that greater population. Yeah, of course. And yet we've become larger. I often think this about the way that America is populated. I mean, we're a country in the UK of around 65 million, give or take a few. I don't know. I haven't counted them all personally. I'll certainly give a few if I could. Uh, United States of America is a nation of 300 million people significantly more population than us although it's spread over a, a larger area so obviously their population density is much lower than ours but all those 300 million people in America if we take I mean obviously it's a mashup but if we take pr- uh, the Caucasian white population of America that all descends from Europeans so how many Europeans went to America to give this greater number this stat confused me the other day Scotland's a nation of around five and a half to six million people as part of the United Kingdom. It's about a tenth of the United Kingdom's population. And yet there's around 20 million Americans that are descended from Scots. Mm. So how many, do you know what I mean? Well, it does annoy me a bit because I find a lot of Americans... How come we haven't got 25 million plus in Scotland? I think Americans identify themselves with the, the I'm quarter this, quarter this, well, one eighth this, one eighth. The, the new the New York cop was always Irish. The New York restaurant owner was always an Italian. The yeah. New York businessman was always Jewish. They always have this sort of heritage thing that they look to go back to, don't they? Well, yeah, they do. And whenever you see an interview in a magazine, it's like I'm Irish, Italian, German, blah blah yeah. blah. And you think, well, where are you from? You know, yeah. where are we from? I'm I'm English. You know, I haven't gone back that far to look back. You know. Yeah, but if I went back three hundred years. 400 years in terms of American history, I would still be English. Yeah. If I went back possibly a couple of thousand, we might be, I might be sitting here saying, well, I'm quarter Danish or Anglo-Saxon or something like that. Then yeah. you could start creating an ethnic divide, but you'd have to go a long way back. Whereas obviously in their history, it's much more recent. But I, I can understand identifying with your roots, but I mean, you, you've got to say at one point, I'm a US citizen. And but that, that was that's the point it. of population expansion. I think it fascinates me how that can happen. Yeah. You know, in Scotland, they haven't reproduced at that rate, but in America, there's loads of them. They're like the Andromeda strain. Well, is it like having a goldfish bowl? Will the fish grow to the size of the bowl? Is it, is it like that? Yeah, because you know. fish release a hormone and it tells them the volume of water that's around them and their growth pattern is dictated by the return of that hormone. And is it the same with humans? No, probably not. No. No. Because I imagine our equivalents in America would probably be similar health, a similar height, a similar weight. Mm-hmm. There wouldn't be a sort of third world disparity or anything like that because we all live at a certain standard. And we come from the same sort of subgroup, so no. Where the f*** does that tie into the Andromeda <laughs> strain? It, uh, it ties in, Dave, it ties in. Yeah. I think that's about all we've got, really. Well, we've made a, you know, an, an, a movie that many people saw was enthralling and uh, scientific, and some people saw it as quite dull and boring. I mean, uh, we, we kind of made the best of it, I think. I, I like it. I like it. I enjoyed watching it again. I watched it, I think, a bit like yourself. I split it. Yeah. I watched half last night and half this morning. Yeah, me too. It's a, it's a bit of a film to get through. So if you went to the cinema, it could potentially be a bladder buster. But yes, it's not that action impact. But I liked I f- following the process. I wanted the scientists to succeed. I liked being able to see every step of that research and seeing their breakthroughs. Obviously, I'm on maturity enough where I can sit and enjoy that. I'd be yeah. interested by that. I mean, that obviously, a lot of people perhaps won't be. Like we said, it's not this is all about you won't want to take your child to see it, not because it would scare your child. Frankly, your child's going to be bored by it because there's a lot of grown ups talking. But I was able to enjoy it. How many points would you give it out of 10? Out of 10. Controversial. No matter what I say, it's going to be controversial because it's not, it's got enough flaws to keep it away from high marks, but I feel it's worth more than low marks. So it's going to have to come in in the middle. I think we gave some like event horizon to something like a middle mark, but this deserves a middle mark. But it feels to me like it deserves a better middle mark. Out of ten, one of us has got to go first. I'll, I'm, t- I'll I'm, go. I'm going to be brave and say seven. I was going to say six and a half. Yeah. So yeah, okay, I agree because I think the the idea is what carries the film and, and makes us you know like it as a, an yeah. intelligent piece of film. So yeah. Yeah. It's it's, it's not eye candy. It's not action packed. 
But all the same, I liked following the story and the process in the story. And I think it, it, we have to give it credibility for an attempt at realism. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The Andromeda Strain. There you go. news BBC Norfolk 2nd of November 2016 pilot grounded after breaking sound barrier over Norwich a US Air Force pilot has been suspended from flying after breaking the sound barrier over Norwich RAF Lakenheath has confirmed earlier in the afternoon people reported here an loud explosion over the city with comments on social media describing houses and windows shaking after the sonic boom there are restrictions on flying over populated areas and jets are not supposed to break the sound barrier. A short time ago, a spokesman confirmed that an F-15C Eagle assigned to the 48 fighter winger RF Lakenheath had been flying over East Anglia. Well, they will do. East Lakenheath's in yeah, It's East not Anglia. far, is it? No. He added the pilot will receive additional training to prevent this in the future and will not fly again until his training is complete. We offer our sincerest apologies for any disturbance this may have caused and we will continue to emphasise airspeed restrictions in flight briefings. We've had this happen before recently. We have, I remember, yeah, was it some garden furniture was damaged, wasn't it? Uh, in Cambridgeshire, yeah, yeah it was um, chandelier. That was the RAF that time. Mm-hmm. That was um, Connonsby based ty- typhoons that were on an intercept, QRA. So, you could argue that was just a fireball. Because if there was a Russian military aircraft coming down the channel or something and they had to get to a point where they could intercept it, they're not going to dawdle out, are they? Well, we've, we've had um, a Russian fleet go up the channel recently, haven't we? So uh, That's what a lot of the traffic that's going mm-hmm. on. People are going out and having the snout, basically. Yeah. I think in a, in a case of what those typhoons in a QRA, if they've got something that could be a hijacked airliner or something like that, I think they're justifiable to go supersonic to get to it if they need to. Obviously, the US Air Force is not responsible for the air, air defence of the United Kingdom. They are a lodging unit here. So what this guy was doing, going supersonic over Norwich, I don't know. No. Well, maybe he just wanted to get out of East Anglia, you know, get out <laughs> over the wash. Just went wanted to go for a baz. Yeah, probably. I mean, sure, that's all the, all the training this guy needs. Look, you know, just keep your speed below a certain level. Keep it subsonic and it won't happen. Yeah, but it's just like the Barry boys you hear going around Ely, isn't it? If you, you think, think so. If you've got this machine... You, you think he ripped the old tailpipes off his F-15 Eagle and stuck one of them cherry bomb exhausts on the side. Yeah. <laughs> it's <going over> <laughs> <and> <laughs> <laughs> flies Blue up. lights on the underneath. <laughs> oh, like an LED strip. <laughs> yeah. It's been lowered on the undercarriage. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Oh dear. We have these things from time to time, don't we? we get a sonic beam and that, but yeah. Okay, well, fair enough. That's all we've got on that. And in other local news, let's have a taste of the East, shall we? A I taste think- of the Orient. <laughs> This one's from our good old go-to staple that never lets, a bit like Dean Shepard, it never lets us down when we need something we've got to go back to. Dated November the 1st, 2016, the UK's first sake brewery at Fordham Abbey is blessed before building gets underway. I struggled to read that there because I even put it in an oriental font. You did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Japanese company Dojima is beginning building on the brewery on the Fordham Abbey Estate, creating 100 jobs and inviting guests to a traditional Jin Chin Zai ceremony to purify the building site on Friday the October 28th. Obviously this is retrospective. The ceremony was laid on to purify the construction site and prayers were said for the safety of all of those involved with the build, which is nice. It's a good set. I mean, if you open a new business and you're from like out of town, um, then why Which not? Obviously, Dojima Saki Brewery are. Don't sound too local to me, it's, but no. I mean, yeah, um, why not get uh, local people involved and perhaps a little tasting session, you know, and have a look around? So. It's always dignitaries, though, isn't it? Yeah. They wouldn't invite you and me to go no, there. Not, right? No, not the only you know, way. Hot one pub, would you like to come along and, and, and sample some sake and take part in the ceremony? I'd go, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would go, yeah. Walk around handing our cards out, you know. 
mixing and shaking. The build is expected to take nine months to complete with the first production of Saki available in, two, in October 2017. Once finished, the Dojima Saki Brewery aimed to make 10,000 bottles in their first trading year. His Excellency Ambassador Koji Suroka, I believe is how it's pronounced, attended the event and said, although this is a ceremony that happens in Japan when a new building is being constructed, it has never happened in the UK. And I was happy to be a part of it. But, uh, let's let's um, say, first of all, great new jobs. Um, it's a nice little enterprise, nice little project out there, and um, I'm sure locally people will welcome you know, the opportunity to work for such a company. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, what we... What about sake, though? I mean, well, this is what I'm thinking. Have you ever had sake? I have had sake. Is it a wine basically distilled from rice grain? Basically, yeah. Okay. But so. I'm just thinking about the uh, authenticity of it, because well, you like know, champagne and fizzy wine and tequila and Cornish pasties. You know, they have to be from the original. Yeah, but a Cornish pasty from anywhere else isn't Cornish pasty. Exactly. It's just a pasty. That's what I mean. So it's the ones we had at Celebration sake. Europe didn't even qualify as cardboard. No, that was a cardboard pasty. It's They're, a Celebration pasty. They were dr- dug out from a trash compactor. So, they? so is it really sake, or is it sake styled, sake influenced, false sake? It will be flavoured. Sake. Is it to like champagne what Blue Nun would be if you put it in a soda stream? Oh, <laughs> yeah. What is it? Actually, I'm thirsty how you said that, Dave. That sounds Not great. What, the Blue Nun in the yeah. soda stream? Yeah, or a bit of Riceling or Hock. Can you get fizzy sake? Uh, no, you can't. I think I met a new old girl once called Fizzy Sake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was she from the Philippines? I don't know. You just drop an Alka Seltzer in it. Yeah. Alka Seltzer and fizzy sake is all you need to keep your. Um, I've never personally had sake. It's one of the things that's on my bucket list, along with trying sushi. You know, something I'm going to have to do some point in my lifetime. Is there really a demand for sake rice wine in the United Kingdom or for the nearby European export market? Uh, I, I tell you what, the um, sushi market has gone through the roof. There are sushi restaurants in every. It's town. not as raw as it used to be. No, no. It's, oh, <laughs> he's overcooked that. But. <laughs> Basically, I think that people like to try a Japanese sort of authentic cuisine, yeah, and yeah. why not have an authentic drink with it? And I, I do believe that you know people sushi is the, the the now food. It's the takeaway food. It's the lunch food. It's healthy. I mean, a, a couple of years ago, it, it always was, looks presented very well. It's so very I've beautiful. always want. I like the idea of the sort of conveyor belt and the dishes going past and totaling the bill from the number of dishes. And there's something very civilized and really rather novel and I've always wanted to try sushi I've never had it There's and it's not just raw fish that's what a lot of no. people yeah misconception it, I mean people use smoked salmon or, or tuna that's already in a can or something like that you, you can make your own sushi you don't need to have like raw fish so. no you don't know, just would scoop the family goldfish out of the bottom and flop it on your plate well, if he's chips. Look, yeah if he's looking a bit rough yeah I've never had sake is there really a, a UK market for sake is sake expensive I it imagine is, a lot of it would be imported from the far east anyway wouldn't it it could be as expensive as uh, like a good bottle of whiskey you know if it's old sake you know but yeah I believe a lot of it's probably made in China Probably, probably not Japan. So some of it has a vintage. Some of it is better once it's been sitting around in a cask or a bottle for a few years. That's right, yeah. So what would be a good sake to drink? How old would a sake be to be sort of... I'm not a sake expert. I, I don't know, really, Dave. I would say eight years, something like that. Mm. But, but is it wise years. to have somewhere, you know, around here where we've got, like, bottles of sake getting produced? I think with the, the current uh, situation in the UK... I think uh, exporting goods from here will probably be a bit cheaper than the EU. I was in um, Holland last weekend dressed as a clown, and I, <laughs> I was I was paying between. Were you drunk on sake? Yeah, I wasn't drunk on sake, but I was paying between six and nine euro a pint of beer. And as we know, it's one to one at the moment the currency exchange. So right. you know, it was it's very expensive at the moment in Europe. Okay. So yeah, I mean, let's, let's hopefully that'll go. Well. I like the idea of basically blessing a, a building site. I think that's quite funny. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see a bit of a culture. Like I said, most of the dignitaries were council officials. I think our MP Lucy Fraser is it now that we have was there as well. That kind of thing. But yeah, we got a, a sake brewery. Well, that's nice. We'll have to do a little tour. I think we should do go on a taste tour. Yeah, like you can go around a whiskey distillery. We'll go to Fordham and go around getting slightly smashed up on sake. Sounds great to me. Yeah. Okay. Got anything? 
Um, let's have a look. Um, do you remember branching out in Liverpool? We want to have a story about branching out. Um, yeah, yeah. The dirty um, underpants. The story. dirty underpants story. Well, you can find that in a previous episode, guys. Yeah. Um, the general manager of branching out in Liverpool has been left angry and ashamed after items of household rubbish were once again dumped on the shop's doorstep overnight. Sue Duggan said, "Shame on the person who left this outside the branching out charity shop." Whoever you are, I want you to know how cross I am with your behaviour and why. So basically, the pictures, uh, you can find this in the local press, the pictures are people just putting, like, rubbish, just absolute rubbish and leaving it outside the charity shop. I mean, like, things that are just useless. And that should really be going in the tip or, you know, down, down to the waste disposal place at Witchford or somewhere like that. So, you know, why do, do people not understand, the, the, you know, what this facility is for? What well, this isn't the first time branching out has been in the news for people leaving the wrong things there. And they've tried to give the message before about what's useful to them and what isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I, this is such a great of mine. There are local disposal and recycling facilities for your waste. Don't just dump them in a charity shop's doorway thinking that they can do something. They're not a recycling centre. They're a charity shop. They're trying to resell existing items, not make a new vac pack for a Easter egg out of your old cup or something. That's not how it works. Yeah. I don't know what people are thinking when they do this. Well, I'm going to try to get hold of Sue Duggan and just have a chat with her, Dave, and uh, maybe get a little interview for Hot Wamper and just find out you know, Please do, what yeah. local, yeah, yeah. local news about... Um, well, they recently got broken into, didn't they? And somebody was stealing coats, and I think they were caught on CCTV or security camera footage of some sort um, trying on stuff as they were stealing it and stuff really? that they were reje- rejecting. They were thrown to one side. But I think one of them selected three or four different jackets that he liked... So he walked out, and he couldn't have enough hands with all his other swagger that he had stolen. So he walked out basically wearing about five, four or five jackets, looking like the Michelin man, all puffed out, because he couldn't carry stuff, so he's wearing stuff that he'd stolen. The way this charity gets treated, come on. I mean, who thinks this is acceptable? Yeah. Has it become something of a local culture or a joke to treat them this way? Well, well I, will, I will get hold of Sue and have a, have a chat with her. Yeah, I'll try to record that conversation and get it into our next episode, an yeah. update about some of the some of the crazy things that people have been doing in their charity shop because it, it, this is a running story. It seems to come up every few months. They're branching out, does yeah? For some yeah. reason, I don't know why. And you think the the multitude of charity shops in Ely, and we don't hear nothing about this no. yet. For some reason, branching out. Yeah, is it target in Littleport? Yeah, I, I don't know quite what that's all about. Yeah. Okay. Okay, one other story I've got is um, from Soham. A horse had to be rescued. <laughs> I know this one. <laughs> after it escaped from a nearby paddock and fell into a swimming pool. I mean, there aren't many swimming pools around this area, are there? Uh, two fire crews from Cambridge and one from Newmarket were called just after 4.35 to a home in the Coates in Soham. Mm-hmm. The horse was in three feet of water, which isn't that deep for a horse, is it? No. Station commander Dave Allen said the horse was shivery as the water was very, very cold. Uh, they managed to sort of make up some kind of ramp and they could uh, pull yeah. the, and a head harness and they managed to, to pull the he- horse out of uh, the swimming pool. Is that like a sensible way to go about it? Yeah. A horse fell in a swimming pool. What do you think? Do you think it probably thought it was like a watering hole? A bit uh, thirsty? Or, or maybe it just cleared a... A hedge and landed just straight there. in it. Yeah, he thought he was doing the Grand National or something, some kind of water hazard. Why can't it get out of three feet of water? I, I guess because the the edge is too high for a horse to get its leg above. Well, I can get out of three feet of water. I, I would struggle to be honest. But yeah, but if you go swimming or something, you could pull yourself out of water yeah, if you had to. Yeah. So um, that's without necessarily being able to touch the bottom with your feet. I just, I just wonder how many people have s- swimming pools around this area. You know? well, well, how many people have swimming pools with horses in them? Yeah, three foot of water. As we know, you can drown in an inch. Yeah. Although I wouldn't have thought that'd be a problem for a I'm sure a horse could keep his head above the water. Three foot of water. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, it's not the usual thing you expect to get called out to, is it? Or is no. it even? A, I think I just go for a swim this morning. I'll yeah. put that horse in the pool. <laughs> yeah. You could say he was the main man. Yeah, somebody must have put it there. You think it's some horse play? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell him to shoe. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you can't swim in that water now. If you drink it, you'll get the trots. Oh, yeah, I can imagine that. A bit whiffy, wouldn't it? Mm. 
Yeah, I imagine it was cold though this time of year. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of which, I mean, Halloween was uh, last weekend. Yeah. Um, did did you have many visitors coming? No. Out? No. Did you have any? Well, I was in Holland, so I, I don't we know. We don't know. No, I don't know. Maybe but I did. I'll tell you what happened. I mean, that's that was on a night when um, the missus comes back late and picks a little up from after school class. She weren't back till gone six anyway. It's already dark by that time now. Um, I'd got home from work about quarter to four because they're back late. The house is quiet. So I went to bed for a couple of hours, got a couple of hours kip. So if anyone knocked on the door during that time, I wouldn't have known about it anyway. It was dark and it was quiet. Nobody turned up later on. So you wouldn't want to see Dave after a siesta anyway, I don't think, would you? No, it's not, that's not the prettiest <laughs> thing. Yeah, not, you know, the, other, the old guy that we were talking about, the Andromeda strain. Jackson, yeah. Yeah, he drinks Sterno. Yeah. yeah. It's something like that. But <laughs> I've been in the worst mood. Um, no, I didn't get any. No, well, I mean, in, in Holland, we dressed up as clowns, as I said. Uh, yeah. It was good. Um, a, a few Dutch people did look at us, point, and say, killer clown. And we were like, no, we're just friendly clowns. And they were fine with us. And You do want that distinction. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and I mean, I made sure I looked like a traditional circus clown. So yeah. Not, not like with fangs and a bloody aggressive looking eyes and stuff like that. Well, you didn't have a meat cleaver. Or no, no okay, cleaver. Fair enough. But the, I, the attention we got from young ladies in the club um, was incredible. Really? They wanted to come. Oh, my friend's scared of clowns. Will you come and dance with her? You know, I mean, <laughs> so next next year, Dave, if you fancy a trip to Holland, you know, it's a, it's a lovely place. Well, you know what they say about guys with big feet? Um, Maybe that was it, the shoes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and the squirty flower. And clogs. And you've won. That's all it takes. All these years, <clears throat> looking after your grooming and all the rest of it, and that's all it took. Oh, well. Nothing else for this episode? Nothing else for this I episode? I think, something like, so we've done a few dark films recently in Showcase, so I think if we perhaps go for something that's a bit fun and a bit lighter for the next one. Yeah. And I was having to think about this myself. And why not go for Moonraker? Moonraker? Okay, its credibility as a film isn't great. Yeah. But it is sci-fi, isn't it? And it's got plenty of camp cheesy moments of dialogue that I'm looking forward to trying to mix into some sort of an intro of every politically incorrect and cheesy term that's in the film. And there's plenty. I'm up for that, yeah. And I've got the DVD on special edition. Well, not because I specifically brought Moonraker. It's because we all the Bond films in a box set. So I've got the second one, and I've watched it a few times. And, and they're like, always on ICV2 or something on yeah. the weekend. So. And I know the tech details about the film All right. because of that. So I think, let's go for Moonraker for a bit of fun. Let's do it. And who wouldn't want an episode of Hot Womper that open, doesn't open with a Bond intro? Oh. And then my own little mix of all the cheesy lines out of it afterwards. Perhaps we should film a little trailer ourselves down the road or something. Get you in a tuxedo <laughs> running down Where the street. Who are we going to have as a Bond girl? Oh, oh yeah that's true around this area yeah <laughs> <laughs> perhaps we can foil a plot at Dejima's new Fordham Saki brewery yeah perhaps we can go in there and find they're producing some sort of germ agent for distribution on a satellite which was of course the theme of Moonraker yeah and comes back to Andromeda strain um, so we, whilst we haven't connected Kevin Bacon to the uh, Michael Crichton what we have managed to do is connect the Saki brewery at Fordham to Moonraker <laughs> the Andromeda strain which is brilliant should we do it let's Moonraker. do it yeah Moonraker for the next episode so that's your heads up guys yeah I mean and, that's that's well in advance and we'll make sure we um, email everyone on the mailing list and yeah. uh, we'll get some promotional material if we've tagged you get your email into that email list so we can put you on there everyone's and, seen it yeah you've been tagged There's no, I don't mean like an offender being tagged although yeah. some of them probably should you know, get yourself on there, then we can give you the heads up. Like I said, we were not going to use it that often. We will not give the email to any third party, and we will only use it in the context of the show. And I think really that's it for episode 36 of Hot One. 36, Pop. yeah, there we go. Hello to any new listeners we've got. We've yep. picked up some lately. Um, hopefully we'll get a bit more at the Star Wars podcasting page. We're on there now, and I'm looking forward to getting more of our stuff on there. And uh, I've been reviewing a lot of other podcasts on there recently. It is a good thing to do, I think, yeah. for relationships with other podcasts. Well, the thing is, I think a lot of people are just publishing their latest episode on there. And I guess great. It's another page, another forum where you can put it up there and people can check you out in another location. But that was all seemed to be happening on that page. So I've tried to put a post on there and offer to do that just to try and make it a bit more interactive and a bit more lively. And I, I think it's quite successful. Yeah, I've you've got a lot of response, haven't you? Yeah. And I think Dave's right. I think initially when you start a podcast, the first thing you think is, right... I'm going to be better than everyone else. Screw everyone else. I just want to be my own entity that's going to be the best possibly, you know, in the world. 
that doesn't happen. No. I mean, we've noticed in this world that, you know, the people that have helped us are more than likely doing a similar thing to us anyway. You know, yeah. they're trying to get themselves out there, get themselves noticed. So if you can give a foot up to your fellow podcast, your fellow sort of filmmaker, yeah. etc., and we found that probably more rewarding than competitive, haven't we? So. I think there's an understanding as well, because when we've obviously you often sort of trying to consider how to push the show, the show still it hasn't really grown from our initial success. How to how to reach more people, how to get more interaction and stuff, and it is, and I've actually felt a bit fortunate on looking at and listening to a few, because I mean I've not. On the iTunes scale of one to five, I've not rated any of the ones I've reviewed under four, and that's genuine. You know, if something really was that dire, I'd give it one or two. I wouldn't reserve myself. Most of them have been four. There's been a couple of exceptional ones that I've given fives to, uh, but they've all been very good podcasts consistently. And I've looked at some of them, and I, looked at them, and I think some of these people, when you look at the popularity bars on iTunes and the problems they're having to get comments on their own sort of posts makes me realise just how tough it is being yeah. a podcaster to reach someone. The thing is, we don't need really to compete with each other as podcasts because of all the ones I've listened to, every single one of them is different to the last. And yeah. they all bring something slightly different, as I hope we do. So I don't know that we're necessarily in competition with other podcasters. Well, we're, we're definitely unique. I mean, we're not a Star Wars podcast. We're, no. we're, we're a multitask sort of sci-fi podcast with a bit of local news, which mm. is a, a niche in itself, isn't it? Mm. So you know. But then that's just a bit of lightweight stuff at the end. We have to open the show up a bit more to bring us back to normality and get people out of sci-fi mode. You know, yeah. And just have a bit of... Sometimes if we're doing quite a dark film, quite a dark topic, we can discuss moral implications. It's nice at the end of it to have a bit of a laugh and a giggle, isn't it? Number 37 is definitely going to be puntastic, I feel, with a bit of Roger Moore. Can't, it can't go wrong. No, it, it can't, can't go, go wrong. wrong. There you go, Hot One, episode 37. We shall record it in a fortnight. The showcase will be Moonraker. I need some moonlight in there. The showcase <laughs> will be Moonraker. Whatever Star Wars news is relevant, whatever local news, I've got a back catalogue of stuff we haven't finished or covered yet. We've got enough local news to last us for months. And with um, Firework Night tonight, I'm sure we'll get we'll a few interesting... We'll have even more local news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know in advance what's coming. And we will be emailing people. We will be following you up. Chasing you around. Watch the skies. Watch the skies. You're not alone. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again in a fortnight. Thanks. Bye-bye.